My name is Sergey Levin, and I'm going to talk about deep reinforcement learning with real-world data. Let's start with a big question. What makes modern deep learning work? Well, if we have a really big model, and we train it on a really big server with lots of GPUs that we buy for lots of cash, and we have lots of data, ideally label data, then we can get really good results on image recognition, machine translation, speech recognition, and many other applications. But in practice, oftentimes we're really bottlenecked by the availability of large, strongly labeled data sets. So it becomes really appealing to think of ways to use lower quality data. For example, maybe we can get away with a small data set that tells us exactly what we need to do and some large, cheap source of data that just generally tells us about the world, a kind of garbage data set that we can use to learn general purpose priors. This is basically the idea behind unsupervised learning and self-supervised learning. But what is it that we're actually learning from when we do this? Well, the core of unsupervised learning is learning P of X, the distribution of the data set. Essentially, this is learning the process that produced the data. Um, this is, for example, what large language models do, and that's what a lot of unsupervised techniques in general do. But if the whole premise behind this concept is still leverage data that is of questionable provenance, cheap data that we can source from the web, learning P of X starts looking a little problematic. For example, if we want to use lots of images that we just pull off a of Flickr, in a sense, we're learning about the kinds of pictures that people like to randomly photograph. In general, the notion of learning P of X as a way to utilize cheap data sources sort of goes against this ethos of trying not to care about where your data came from. And maybe that's why large generative models that produce beautiful pictures in response to text require carefully curated data sets, and maybe that's why prompting large language models is such an art form. So could there be a better way for us to use cheap, readily available, previously collected data. To start to think about this question, we can step back a little bit and ask a more basic question. Why do we need machine learning in the first place? And to answer that, we can ask an even more basic question. Why do we need brains? Daniel Walpert, a British neuroscientist, has strong opinions on this topic. Walpert says that we have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. Movement is the only way we have affecting the world around us, and I believe that to understand movement is to understand the whole brain. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that Daniel Walpert works on the neuroscience of motor control, but we can formulate a postulate that generalizes this idea to machine learning. Perhaps we need machine learning for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex decisions. This might be obvious, for example, if you think about a robot or an autonomous car, but perhaps less obviously, even an image classifier is making decisions. Perhaps the decision is the image label, or perhaps the decision really is what happens afterwards. If you tag a user's photograph on a social networking website, that's a decision that leads to some outcome. If you detect an endangered animal in a camera trap, that's a decision that leads to some outcome. These decisions have consequences, and in the, at the end of the day, we want our machine learning system to take those decisions that lead to the outcomes that we most prefer. So if we take this perspective, perhaps it becomes very natural to think of reinforcement learning as a way to use cheap previously collected data because reinforcement learning is the formal framework that we can use to reason about decisions and their consequences in the context of machine learning. So perhaps we can take a large cheap data set of previously collected data, our garbage dump from before, in combination with a limited amount of supervision that tells our reinforcement learning algorithm what the task is, and then we can use the cheap readily available data not to learn what to do, not to learn about the source of the data or how to reproduce it, but rather to learn how the world works. Take the data for what it is. Use it to understand the possible consequences of different decisions, not to take those decisions, but to learn which decisions to take and which ones not to take. And then use the limited amount of supervision to determine what the task is so that you can take the right decisions based on what you've learned from that cheap data. As a concrete example, imagine a robot that has memories of many different tasks that have performed before. Maybe none of those tasks are exactly what the user wants right now, but when the user specifies a new task, perhaps the robot can reflect on its past experience and figure out what that experience tells it about how to solve the new problem that it's faced with. Now, in principle, reinforcement learning can give us a great framework for doing this, but in practice, there's a problem, because reinforcement learning is two different things. First, it's a framework for learning-based decision-making, where supervised learning tells us how to go from inputs to labels, reinforcement learning tells us to go how to go from states to actions which represent decisions so as to produce the desired outcomes which are high rewards. But reinforcement learning is also another thing. It's a framework for active online learning for control. 
This is the classic diagram from the Sutton and Bardo textbook, which we can summarize as having an agent that interacts with the world, collects a little bit of experience, uses that experience to improve its behavior, throws out that data, and repeats the process again. Now, decision-making is what almost all real-world learning problems look like. As I argued before, the whole point of machine learning is to make good decisions. Unfortunately, active online learning in the real world is often very difficult. So we would really like to have one without the other in order to be able to leverage plentiful, large sources of low-quality prior data. So we need to make RL look more like data-driven learning. We need to go away from the framework where we are wedded to this active online paradigm but retain the ability to reason about decisions and their consequences instead of having to simply model P of X. So instead of doing on policy RL, we must do offline RL, where we can run reinforcement learning on a previously collected data set, extract the best behavior support under that data, and then deploy the resulting policy, or potentially even use what we learned as pre-training for some downstream tasks. So that's what I'm going to talk about in today's talk. I'll start by discussing some offline RL fundamentals and show some recent results. Then I'll discuss offline pre-training in the context of robotics. And then I'll discuss offline RL for large language models. And then finally, I'll conclude with a discussion of some future directions toward large-scale reinforcement learning as a general pre-training paradigm. So let's start with the fundamentals. First, what do we really expect offline RL methods to really do? Well, one intuition that sometimes comes up that I think is not very good is that offline RL is a lot like imitation learning. That's what I was criticizing before. You don't want to co just copy the garbage dump. You want to do better than the average thing in the garbage dump. So if the green is your start, the orange is your goal, perhaps the imitation learning intuition thinks your data looks like this and you just want to copy it. But that's not what you want to do. Though it can be shown that even in the imitation learning setting, offline RL should be preferable. But perhaps what you really want is closer to getting order out of chaos. Maybe your data looks like this, and you want to find a path through segments of that data that achieve the task you want. And you don't have to literally copy parts of the data because your network will actually generalize. So you have to copy the concepts in the data in some generalizable way. This could involve a kind of a macro level stitching where if you've seen paths that go from A to B and paths that go from B to C, you can figure out how to go from A to C. But the same thing can be replicated at a much finer scale. For example, imagine that you have many suboptimal paths that go from the start to the goal. They're all bad, but they're all bad in different ways. And in some places, each of them is good. Well, if you take the best part of each piece of the data, they can get a much better path overall. Imagine learning how to drive by copying the best parts of every human driver. The resulting policy would be much better than any single human. So if we have good offline RL methods, we can take this idea much further and get near optimal policies, even from highly suboptimal data. Now what's hard about offline RL? Well, the fundamental problem is counterfactual queries. If you've only ever seen data of cars driving on roads, the RL algorithm needs to decide if swerving left to go off the road is a good idea or a bad idea. And how do you know if you didn't see it in the data? Online RL algorithms don't have to handle this because they can simply try the action and see what happens. But offline RL has to somehow account for unseen out of distribution actions, ideally in a safe way, while still making use of generalization to come up with behaviors that are better than the best thing seen in the data. So take the action if you can generalize to it, but avoid it if you can't. To get into the technical uh, summary of how offline RL works, let me start with a little bit of formalism. In reinforcement learning, we have an agent that interacts with the world by choosing actions A, and the world responds with states S and rewards. The goal is to design a policy that chooses actions so as to maximize the total reward the agent will experience over its lifetime. A very useful object for doing this is something called the Q function. This is a function of a state and action that will tell us if we take that action in that state and then follow the policy pi, what is the total reward that we will accumulate? If we can learn a Q function for a given policy pi, then we can recover a new policy that is as good or better by taking the action that has the largest Q value in every state. This is the base of policy iteration. We can also cut out the middleman and directly learn a Q function that is equal to the reward plus the maximum over the actions of the next time step Q value. This is called the Bellman optimality equation. And if we minimize the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side of this equation, for all states and actions, then we will recover the Q function for the optimal policy. And that leads to the familiar Q learning algorithm. Minimize the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side of this algorithm for all states and actions, or in practice, using a sample of states and actions, which can be collected with any policy. In principle, this provides us with an offline RL method. But in practice, just this idea by itself doesn't work, 
due to something called distributional shift. To understand distributional shift, let's take that right-hand side of that Bellman optimality equation and rewrite it in a slightly different way. Instead of writing it as a max over actions, let's write it as an expected value under some distribution pi nu, which takes the argmax action with probability 1. So I didn't change anything, I just wrote this in a different way. And let's call these target values y. You would expect the expected value of q under pi nu would be accurate if the distribution under which q is trained is similar to pi nu. So what's the training objective? Well, the training objective is to minimize the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side in expectation under pi beta, which is the policy that collected the data set. So here's the target value, here's the behavior policy, and we would expect good accuracy when pi beta is equal to pi nu, because we, if we test under the same distribution that we trained on, we should expect to get the right answer. But how often does that happen? And even worse, pi nu is actually selected to maximize the q values, so it will certainly deviate from pi beta because it will pick the actions that have larger values. In fact, since pi nu is chosen to optimize against q, this resembles adversarial examples, in the same way that if we optimize the input of a neural network to minimize the probability that it will produce the correct answer, if we minimize the input into a neural network to maximize its output, we will certainly find some adversarial action that will fool it. And that's exactly what we see in practice. If we run naive offline RL, we get policies with fairly low rewards, you know, negative, negative 250 or so, whereas the predicted Q values are enormous. The y-axis here on the right is a log scale, so that red curve thinks it's going to get 10 to the seventh power, when in fact it gets negative 250. So we get massive overestimation due to what is essentially an adversarial example. I'll describe one possible algorithm that could mitigate this issue. There are many different offline RL methods, but we found this conservative Q-learning method to work very well across the board, and that's what all the results that I'm going to present today are actually going to be using in one form or another. The idea is that we have this massive overestimation problem, and we can intuitively think of it like this, that if the green curve represents the true function and the blue curve represents your fit, the blue curve might be good in many places, but if it overestimates in some place, that's exactly the place that will be selected when we optimize the policy. So what we're going to do instead is we'll take our regular objective that minimizes the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side, and we'll augment it with a regularizer that tries to find these actions with large Q values and push down their value. So you'll notice that we're minimizing this with respect to Q, and we're maximizing it with respect to mu, which is the distribution over actions. So we try to find high Q value actions and reduce their value, much like adversarial training. We can show that this guarantees that the learned Q function will lower bound the true Q function if the regularizer coefficient is large enough. Now, in practice, we need to extend this algorithm in various ways to make it practical, but that's the essential idea. So now let me tell you about some ways in which we could use this conservative Q learning algorithm that can attain really good results. One very recent application I can tell you about is learning multi-game policies for playing Atari games. So we're going to train with conservative Q-learning using highly suboptimal data from 40 different Atari games. So the algorithm must train all the games at the same time with a network that has a different head for each game. So it's going to pre-train uh, to learn these multi-game representations. This is essentially our low-quality prior data. Now, when we do this, we already get performance on the games that radically outperforms the average behavior in the data set. So the pink, the far right bar, represents uh, CQL here, which we call scaled Q-learning because it's applied at scale. The previous best result on this is decision transformers, which used a model with more than three times the number of parameters. And conservative Q-learning here achieves a 2.5x improvement over this prior result, so a radical improvement over, over multi-game decision transformers on highly suboptimal data. In fact, in many cases, this matches or exceeds human normalized performance. But that's not really the main thing. The main thing is that we can take this model and we can fine tune it with offline data to a new game. So we, we can get some suboptimal data for a new game and we get excellent performance. And the, the pink uh, bar on the far left shows scaled Q-learning. And we can also fine tune it with online data to a new game. So this can initialize online exploration and also get excellent results, drastically outperforming uh, all the prior methods that we evaluated. And this is really the power of offline RL, that we can pre-train on large, low-quality data sets and not only do well in the tasks we pre-trained on, but also get excellent initializations for downstream tasks. Now, there are many other applications and extensions uh, of conservative Q-learning in particular and offline RL in general. I'll tell you about some, including robotics and dialogue systems. I already mentioned Atari games. Prior work has used conservative Q-learning for a variety of applications. For example, LinkedIn 
used it for optimizing notification policies, attaining improvements in click-through rate, and reducing the number of notifications they need to send to get that. Uh, it's been used for um, digital marketing systems for user conversion, also attaining very large improvements over naive strategies that simply imitate the good parts of the data. So the method really works and has been used extensively in practice. But let me tell you about some applications we've developed in the domain of robotics in particular. So to use offline RL in the context of robotics, the first thing we need is a data set. The way you can think about good data sets for robotic offline RL is that if you buy a new robot, you take it out of the box, you'd like some data set of past interactions that you can use to essentially bridge the generalization gap, to pre-train your robot so that even out of the box, it can do something meaningful in your new environment. So that requires a data set that is multitask and multi-environment because your environment is probably different from mine. So the data set that we collected several years ago is called uh, the bridge data set. It's a data set with over, which at this point has over 12,000 demonstrations. It's actually growing all the time. 10 different environments, 70 different tasks, and it's really designed to be reusable by other researchers in new domains for new tasks. So all the data is collected with this low-cost Widow X arm. So it's one robot, but many different environments that are all themed around kind of household tasks of daily living. And that's what we're going to use as this base of past interaction for our offline RL experiments. So we developed this method called pre-training for robots, or PTR, where the idea is that we'll train a multitask policy on all of the tasks in the bridge data, much like that multitask Atari policy from before. We'll condition the policy on a one-hot vector that represents which task the robot should be doing, and then we'll have a downstream task, which will use the last entry in this one-hot vector that's sort of reserved for the new task that you want to fine-tune to. So we'll pre-train on all the bridge data, and then we'll fine-tune cycling the bridge data through the batch to, forget, to prevent forgetting to master some new task. We're going to be doing fine-tuning here with offline RL at first, just using 10 trials for the new task. So we can use this in various different modes. One mode is maybe we have some tasks in the bridge data, like opening doors, and now we'd like to fine-tune the robot to open a new door that's different from doors it's seen before, like this microwave door. So with just 10 trials on this new door, using a policy pre-trained on all of the bridge data, uh, we can get PTR to get a success rate of 60%, which is better significantly than uh, alternative methods, even though this data is really designed for imitation learning. We can also learn an entirely new skill. So here the skill is to put this cucumber, cucumber in a pot, which the robot did not see in any of the prior data. Uh, and PTR here does pretty well uh, on that task as well as other new tasks. One interesting comparison I want to draw your attention to are the two methods on the far right, R3M and MAE. These are pre-training methods, they're also pre-training on the same data as PTR, but instead of pre-training with offline RL, they pre-train with general unsupervised representation learning objectives, like the one I mentioned in the introduction. So these are just trying to learn the distribution in the data. And you can see that these purely unsupervised pre-training methods generally perform significantly worse than PTR, which actually trains with offline RL. So the difference is that PTR is really learning to make decisions that lead to desired outcomes, whereas representation learning methods are simply learning the distribution in the data. So pre-training with offline RL does significantly better in these settings, and it actually continues to improve as we make the networks bigger. So for the harder task, the pick-and-place task, even going from a ResNet 34 to a ResNet 50 during pre-training improves the final performance after fine-tuning. And this is all data that was not collected specifically for offline RL. In fact, the bridge data set was actually designed for imitation learning rather than offline reinforcement learning, and yet offline RL does significantly better than imitation learning here. What about longer tasks? What if we want to pre-train on the bridge data set and then try to efficiently learn some complex multi-stage tasks like putting the sushi on the plate and then putting the knife in the pot? Can we learn general purpose prior knowledge from offline data that we can then leverage uh, either to generalize in zero shot or if the policy fails to generalize, use this knowledge to scaffold efficient fine tuning with autonomous online exploration? So here's how we could do this. Uh, we could take the prior data and we can train three separate objects. A goal condition policy, which takes in the current image and a goal image and tries to reach the goal image, so it's a kind of self-supervised reinforcement learning procedure. A state encoder, which learns the representation that is sufficient for control, so it's basically a bottleneck that leads into the goal condition policy. And an affordance model, which you can think of as a high-level model that represents which goal can be reached from a given state. And the affordance model is very similar to a value function in this case. If we have these three objects, then we can give the robot a temporarily extended goal, like putting the sushi on the plate and the knife in the pot, the goal condition policy may not be able to perform this goal immediately, but what we can do is we can use the representation learned by the state encoder and the affordance model as a model to perform model-based high-level planning over sub-goals, 
to figure out a sequence of sub-goals that will achieve the final task, like first putting the sushi on the plate and then putting the knife in the pot, and then command the first sub-goal to the robot so that the goal condition policy attempts to execute it. And if it fails, then we can use those same sub-goals to further fine-tune the goal condition policy, because the sub-goals provide very good scaffolding so that even relatively simple online RL methods can fine-tune to this task efficiently. So here's a task where the robot has to put the bunny, move the pot, and then put the bunny in the pot. If we just try to train this task with model free RL, the robot moves the pot but then fails to get to the bunny. If we try to generalize our goal condition policy with that planner in zero shot without any online fine tuning, then the policy is clearly trying to do the task, but it doesn't succeed. But if we further used the plan sub goals to actually fine tune the goal condition policy, then we can perform the entire task with a fairly high success rate. And this works on several other long horizon tasks. So that tells you a little bit about how we can use diverse data for offline RL pre-training and then fine tune either with offline data or even autonomously with online interaction. Now let's talk about another application domain. Let's talk about how offline RL can help with language models. So imagine we have a, uh, a task like this task from uh, a paper by Dossadol called Learning Cooperative Visual Dialogue Agents, where you have one agent that has a picture and then a questioner is gonna ask it questions about that picture, like are there any people in the shot or not? And at the end has to guess which picture it is out of a set. So it's a kind of a dialogue question answering task. Um, this is an example of this. Now, of course, language models can create great dialogue, but for this task to be successful, it's not enough to just create dialogue that looks like human speech. You have to be actually very goal directed. You have to ask questions that lead to a particular answer. And of course, you can imagine that goal directed dialogue agents are a very uh, appealing application area for RL because if you can deduce which picture someone has in mind, that's of course a nice test task, but in practice you could convince somebody of something, or uh, you could help somebody uh, with tech support or other goal-directed tasks. In fact, one might argue that all useful dialogue is in some sense goal-directed. Now the good thing about dialogue is that humans talk to other humans all the time, which means that getting offline data from humans is pretty easy. Running online RL with humans is next to impossible because of some complexity. But if we're going to use offline RL, for example, by taking a pre-trained language model and fine-tuning it with offline RL on a data set of human interaction, that's actually very practical. So offline RL is really a perfect fit for dialogue systems. We recently developed a method called Implicit Language Q-Learning, or ILQL. The basic idea in ILQL is to combine two state-of-the-art offline RL methods, implicit Q-learning, which I didn't talk about too much, but it's a kind of a Q-learning procedure, and conservative Q-learning, which has this adversarial training process, and then apply it to training large language models. So the diagram here is pretty complex, but let me take you through it step by step. So we start with some task data, which is basically our dialogue, and this task data is not necessarily optimal. In fact, it might be highly suboptimal. It's all, you know, it all involves the correct dynamics. It's always somebody trying to do the task, but they might be doing it very poorly. We'd like our bot to do the task much better and maybe even to optimize particular objectives in the process. We're going to use a pre-trained model to fine tune one model that simply tries to copy the data. And this is going to be a kind of a proposal model. It'll propose reasonable things to say. And then we'll train a second model, which is a value function that'll rank those proposals. And the value function is also pre-trained as a language model, but then instead of producing probabilities of future tokens, it'll produce their Q values. And those Q values are trained with a combination of implicit Q learning and conservative Q learning. So the loss functions are summarized here. I won't go through them in too much detail. They're covered in the paper, but at a high level, it's very similar to what I discussed before. There's a loss to basically regress to the target values, the left-hand side and right-hand side of that Bellman optimality equation, and a second loss to be conservative to avoid those er the erroneous overestimation for out of distribution tokens. And crucially, this Q function is token by token, so it really assigns a value to every single token, treating every token as a time step and an action. And then at deployment time, what we're going to do is we're going to rank all the potential tokens that we could produce next by a combination of their log probabilities from the behavior clone model and their Q values, or rather their advantage values, obtained from the value function. And then we'll take the token that has the uh, best sum of these two terms. And that'll be the token with the largest advantage that is still probable under the behavior policy. So this is very similar to the offline RL methods we had before. So when we evaluate this on the, that visual dialogue task from before, we could simply try to 
maximize the correctness of our answer, we could also inter incorporate all sorts of other reward functions. For example, uh, a naive model that just optimized for getting the right answer might ask lots of yes or no questions. Maybe we want different kinds of uh, answers. So we can assign a reward function that explicitly penalizes the questioner for asking questions that lead to yes or no. Now, importantly, we're not punishing the model for saying yes or no. We're punishing the model for saying things that lead to the answer, which is outside of the control of the model, saying yes or no. And it actually works. You can actually get a language model to say things so that someone talking to it is less likely to say yes or no. We can use an even more uh, robust penalty. We can actually specifically punish uninformative answers. So not just yes or no, but also kind of synonyms like can't tell or maybe not. And now it starts actually answering, uh, it starts actually asking questions that lead to more complex answers, quantitative answers, colors. So it really understands what kind of questions to ask to manipulate the answer into saying certain things. And in quantitative evaluations, especially with these more complex rewards, ILQL gets significantly better reward values than methods that copy the data, or even methods that copy only the highest reward parts of the data. Uh, we can also use this approach to optimize for producing comments, like think like Reddit comments, uh, that have low toxicity. So the context is the previous comment on Reddit, and the goal is to generate a new comment that either avoids toxic behavior or is likely to receive upvotes. And here, ILQL also does really well, uh, in, including when the reward function is just the actual upvotes in the data. So it's a highly stochastic reward function because, of course, upvotes are very inconsistent and it still does very well. And the advantage function actually tells you which words, which tokens, are the ones that have the lowest advantage in terms of having low toxicity. And you can see it's actually very natural, like saying the word horrible or the word sensor has a low advantage, where saying like comment or on has a, a decently high advantage. So it actually understands what toxicity means in some sense. So the takeaways are offline RL is a really natural choice for language models. Text generation is usually in service to some goal, uh, like successfully completing a dialogue task or convincing somebody of something. And online RL with language is generally infeasible because you have to really talk to humans in real time. But plenty of data is available, even though it's suboptimal, which makes it a perfect fit for offline RL. And you can try ILQL yourself at this URL. So just to conclude, let me say a few words about some future directions. I discussed how offline RL can let us use uh, cheap prior data but this data is likely to be heterogeneous. It might have different embodiments, different tasks, and so on. And for downstream use, we would really like to define tasks in zero shot or few shot. Um, we've recently done some work that tries to actually learn with offline RL from many different embodiments. So the question here was, can we create a data set and model that can generalize in zero shot to control entirely new robots? Uh, the setup was that we had data from many different robotic sources, all the way from large scale ATVs to small scale RC cars. And we trained a goal condition policy and was able to control entirely new robots, including a quad rotor that I had never seen before in zero shot. Now the quad rotor here is pretending to be a vehicle. It's flying at a constant altitude, but still without having ever seen this quad rotor or this camera, the model could immediately control it. So you can actually get generalization over embodiments. Um, you can also learn from offline data without well-defined tasks. You can learn goal condition policies without any reward function at all. Uh, using conservative Q learning, this is some work done at Google called actionable models. And the model was used as a kind of unsupervised pre-training objective that could accelerate downstream acquisition of tasks once a reward function was provided. So that actually works. Uh, although, of course, a lot more research is needed to pre-train on even more general, even more heterogeneous data. But to conclude, I'd like to just summarize what a hypothetical offline RL pipeline might look like. Uh, we'd like to learn from this kind of garbage data, a data set of past interactions, including potentially video data, as well as data from all sorts of embodiments, robots, and so on. We could use this for offline reinforcement learning with either human-defined skills or even unsupervised objectives like goal-conditioned RL or self-supervised skill discovery. And then we can use this to learn a downstream task. Um, I discussed examples where this is an RL task, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. As I mentioned, almost all of machine learning is about making decisions. So pre-training for decision-making should help even when the downstream task is not itself a reinforcement learning task. After all, we need machine learning for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex decisions. Thank you very much for listening.